Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is uh, Angela Rodenberg. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for Redwood Plastics and Rubber. And today we will be doing a quick presentation on plastic bearings. I'm just going to give a few minutes for everybody to join us and we'll get going. Hi again, everybody. Good morning. Um, again, my name is Angela Rodenberg. I'm the VP of uh, Sales and Marketing at Rubber Plastics and Rubber. And I'm happy to introduce Kevin Smith, who is our resident bearing and bushing specialist um, here at Redwood. Although we've got a, uh, a large group of sales professionals that are more than willing to help with a variety of different applications. I'm going to pass the presentation off to Kevin and um, we'll have questions and answer period at the end of this presentation as well. There'll also be a recording of it for everybody to um, that will be available at the end as well, which I'll be sending out by email um, a few days after the presentation. Uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, there's um, a, a little box on your screens for uh, to for you to send in any questions via the chat box. So um, please write those in there and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So for now, I will hand it over to Kevin. Hi, thanks Angela. I'd like to start by thanking everybody in advance for setting aside a little time today uh, for this webinar. I suppose the most of you have already dabbled with plastic bearings in one or more applications in the past or just joining the show today to see if there's anything else that you can benefit by by listening in. Uh, the world of plastic bearing is far too broad and, uh, to completely cover in this short amount of time, so we'll just be skipping through the bulk of the issue and focus primarily on the important stuff. So I'm going to try to keep it pretty informal and kind of keep a little bit of a pace going. So a little bit about myself. I've been in the plastics industry for a little over 15 years, uh, mostly in uh, polymer bearing applications. I've served most of the industries. Haven't done too much in automotive, but um, a lot in uh, food packaging, prep, agriculture, uh, sawmills, and marine applications. Uh, machinist, and by background, uh, but uh, uh, you can read there. I work out of Redwoods Woodland facility, which is just a uh, spitting distance from Portland, Oregon, uh, and I cover the Pacific Northwest uh, in, in this region. So we'll get to the guts of it. Uh, a couple things first, two quick notes. In order to keep the presentation flowing, uh, and save time. I'll be using the word plastic not only when referring to plastic, but even if the best candidate material for the bearing is a full composite, uh, rubber, polyurethane, basically anything other than metal. So we won't be talking about sintered bronze or rolling element bearings. The second thing is really what, you know, uh, what's the difference between a rolling element bearing versus a non-rolling element bearing. You might think of a non-rolling element bearing as a, as a plane bearing, a bushing, a journal bearing, sleeve bearing, slide bearing, friction bearing. They're all pretty much the same thing. It gets a little bit weird when you talk about what's the difference between a, a bearing and a bushing. In my mind, having been in the industry a long time, uh, 
there's really no difference. If a bear is a load, it's a bearing. That's um, right there on the tin. That's why it's called a bearing. But the difference here is that a plane bearing uh, has high load support, is generally thermal or electrically insulative. We'll talk about different type of bulk properties later. Generally, they're self-lubricating and they have no moving parts. So unless thermal expansion is a problem, these bearings don't fail. Uh, so you don't get the seizing that you can get in a um, uh, in a high speed or a rolling element bearing. Uh, the rolling element bearings, you know, as ball bearings or roller bearings, they are intended for high speed. Uh, generally, they are thermally and electrically conductive because they tend to be metal. And they do require lubrication, and unlike a plane bearing, they're generally more sensitive to shock and load impact. If you look at the picture, it kind of makes sense that when you put a ball bearing or a roller bearing on a shaft, that shaft or that load is being supported primarily by one or two, or if you're lucky, three, maybe four uh, rolling elements. So if all the shock and vibration is uh, on those individual elements, uh, you can't get cracking or spalling. So again, a, a rolling element bearing by definition is a frictionless bearing. They tend to be for high speeds and lower loads. Whereas a plane bearing is a, a friction bearing. They tend to be for very high loads, but lower speeds. Okay, so why would you consider a plastic bearing over a, a bronze or rolling element bearing? There's a lot of factors that might make you want to change from a greased metal sleeve or rolling element bearing to a, to a plastic bearing. Uh, plastic bearings generally require less maintenance, almost always, usually. And, the, and thus a lower cost of ownership. Plastic bearings tend to be self-lubricating, so they require no grease. We'll talk about greasing a little bit later on. Plastic bearings are generally more sanitary. If you look at the pictures directly below, you can see that in a food application or even in a heavy or dirty ag application, that grease is gonna trap dirt and contaminants. And unless it's purged out, uh, it just becomes dirty grease, which is, uh, likely to turn into a lapping compound and start to eat up the shaft and the bearing and you know, everything it touches really. Plastic bearings offer greater flexibility in design. Uh, that's generally because they have a, they tend to have a thinner wall thickness, right? So in a rolling element bearing, you got all the rollers, you got an inner case, an outer race, inner race, does take up real estate. So if you're designing something new and you can get away with a thin wall bearing, it, it offers you better flexibility in the design of your equipment. Plastic bearings are generally often quieter. Uh, if you've been next to a, uh, a failing ball bearing, you know what those sound like. And plastic bearings tend to be resistant to corrosion depending on how they're filled. Okay, we can take a look at a couple different applications, most of which you're probably already familiar with. Plastic bearings are found in thousands of applications in just about every industry. You find light duty bearings and exercise equipment. Uh, your car doors, things like that. Things that give you a smooth and quiet operation without the need to lubricate. You find them in dirty and high impact applications like the bin lift and dump components on trash trucks. You find them in hard to lubricate applications like bushings in the in sheaves on the top of that yarder or in the uh, the cylinder push rods there on the log grapple, maybe the slewing bearing. The knuckle joints, you find uh, um, primarily composite bearings there. And you'd find them in high corrosion environments like on davits, boat lifts, car ramps on ferries, things of that nature. Not pictured here uh, in this slide, but you find plastic bearings by the thousands in food preparation and packaging facilities. This is generally due to the frequent washdowns, but it's also uh, because having a seized bearing will usually result in a long and expensive downtime for a piece of equipment. Obviously, that's true in uh, any factory, not just food. So when I'm talking with folks out in the field, uh, the one thing always comes up. I've tried plastic bearings in the past, but they just didn't work for me. So if we ignore the blatant example of trademark infringement in the lower right hand corner, uh, we can we can address these issues. So generally I'll ask, well, how did you go about choosing the plastic that you did for your application? So I'll ask things like, uh, did you do the PV calculations? Generally, the response is, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what PV is. What do you mean? Well, I'll say, well, what about the surface finish on the shaft? 
the gentleman responded, it seemed okay. We hit with some emery cloth, not too bad. What about dirt and contamination? And they'll say, well, there really isn't any. That's why we chose plastic. We thought it'd be okay. Thermal expansion issues, press fit, running clearances, not the same as bronze, not the same as a rolling element bearing. Housing bore finishes, things of that nature. And what about chemical compatibility? Uh, if it's in a washdown, what are you running? A sodium hypochlorate, uh, bleaches, things of that nature. Uh, that all affects swell and uh, long time performance of the bearing. So it's not always that uh, weird that uh, I, I get a lot of responses like, yeah, I tried plastic in the past, just didn't work for me. But once you start to dwell down a little bit into the question, talk about the application, talk about, you know, do an autopsy on the dead bearings, find out what the mode of failure was. Uh, it most often just comes down to the wrong plastic was chosen for that application. Okay, so what we need to do to, to make this right is we need to create a list of material candidates for our bearing. Okay, so how would we do that? Well, a good way to start is with a bearing design worksheet. These are the worksheets that we use. You can download them off of our website. Uh, they're available for sleeve bearings, flange bearings, spherical bearings, all types of bearings like hanger style, thrust bearings, washers, things like that. Uh, the first section, the top, is just simple information for you uh, to fill out about yourself, the company, uh, and what the application is. Okay. So far, we're nothing too hard. Let's jump down to the next section, which is getting to the guts of the matter. This information that we gather in this section is critically important for several reasons. We need this information as accurate as possible so that we can start to build our material candidate list. So it asks questions like, what is the ID of the, the bearing that you're replacing? What are the loads? Okay, we need these to start to do the calculations for our PVs, our pressure and velocity, which is basically our loads and speeds. Okay. So it's pretty important that these be critical. Um, we also need measurements for the OD. This is so that we can start to work on our press fit calculations and our running clearance calculations. We'll go back to the stuff on the right hand side, like the shaft hardness, things like that here in a second. But right now I just want to kind of focus on, on the, uh, the PV. Okay, if you're not familiar with this, don't get scared. It's nothing to be nervous about. If you are, you already know this stuff. But determining the P pressure, V velocity and the PV, the combination of the, the pressure and velocity, um, it's really critical, okay? Depending on the application, this might be the most important step, although not the only step in building your material candidate list, okay? Almost all bearing grades will have a published PV and P and V specification. These specs are not always easy to find and sometimes you get different numbers for the same material. OK, so it's, you know, depending on the source you're looking at, uh, if the application is critical, make sure you double check the specs uh, because I always will. You know, when I'm when I'm looking at an application, I'll check different uh, sources for these materials. Um, it also depends on if the material is cast versus extruded, things like that. And some folks will build on safety margins into their published numbers. Uh, some folks just lie. So. Um, it's important to double check your sources. I'm going to stop real quick here. And if you read the small print on the bottom of the slide, you'll see that p-values are shown in published literature uh, as static condition. And then the v-values are generally shown in unlubricated and no load conditions. PV is almost always shown as unlubricated. Okay, so if you're not familiar with these terms, static, dynamic, things like that, um, you can do a quick little thing that I, I, I'll show people. If you put your hands together like you're going to pray, you know, don't, don't clasp your fingers, but just press your hands together. If you push your hands together real hard, that's your static load, right? Nothing's moving. You're not getting a lot of heat there, but you're getting an awful lot of force, a lot of load. OK, if you back that load off, just rest your hands together and then rub them together kind of vigorously like you're trying to warm them but don't press them together too hard. You get a little bit of heat, but not too much. All right, that's our velocity. Now, if you press your hands together real tight, I know nobody's doing this, but I'm gonna pretend you are. Um, you push your hands together real tight and then rub fast. Partner, it gets hot pretty quick, okay? And it's the heat that we're concerned about. All right, so that's basically your differences between your P, 
your loads, your V, your velocity, and then your combined loads and velocities. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. How we do the formulation. The formulations are very easy. You can pretty much do it in your head. Don't get nervous about the math. The formulation or the formula for load calculation is very simple. It's the pounds, how much actual force you're putting on the bearing, divided by the ID of the bearing times the length of the bearing. Okay, so in this example, we use that bearing to the right, which has a two inch ID and a three inch length, length through bore. We combine those, multiply two times three, we got six. So we've got our load, 200 pounds, divided by six. Your p-value is 33. Now we're converting actual load to PSI, okay? That 33 you're gonna to wanna to write on the back of your hand or on a piece of scratch paper or keep that handy. But you're done with the P calculation. V is, easy, is even easier. We use the same bearing in the same example, okay? The formula for V is your shaft diameter times your RPM times a constant of 0.262. There's other ways to do this, taking the circumferential inches and then dividing by pi, multiplying, blah, 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 and they'll get you a little bit more accurate. But for 99% of your applications, uh, just use this formula. It's easy, it gets you more than close enough. Okay, so let's do the calculation. Our shaft diameter is two inches, based on our example. I just picked a random 120 RPM, because that's about as fast as I can see with my eye. You pick a spot on a shaft like a keyway. If the keyway rotates one time a second, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, the shaft is turning at 60 RPM, right? If the keyway goes by twice in one second, it's going 120 RPM. Any faster than that, you really need a tachometer or something. Anyway, take your shaft diameter, times it by your RPM, multiply that by 2.262, and that's gonna give you your velocity in feet per minute. So we have our P at 33, our V at 63. To get your PV, you just multiply them together. 33 times 63, 2079. You have these three numbers written down. You're done with the math part of, the, of your PVs. Now we need to build our material candidate list. What are we going to make this bearing out of? Um, well, let's just pick our random the usual suspects. Everybody reaches towards UHMW because it's cheap. You can get it in any color. You can get it filled, unfilled. Um, so usually folks will uh, grab that. Now it's important when you're looking at the P value, the V value and the PV value for any material out there, whether it's Delrin, nylon, composite, Teflon, whatever it is, your numbers, your PV or the application PV numbers have got to be lower than the published specs for that material. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, so UHMW has a p-value of 800. That's 800 psi. Well, our application is, 300, is uh, 33. 300 is a lot less than 800, so we're good. That gets a grain mark. But go over to the v-value. Unfilled UHMW has a velocity of 50 feet per minute. Okay, well, we're at 63 for our application, so we're already busted that number. Not by much, but by a little bit. Let's look at the PV. The PV for a UHMW unfilled, 1,000 PV. We're at 2,079. We've more than busted it. I'm gonna throw out UHMW as a candidate here. Hopefully you understand why you see this. What about PTFE? Okay, it has significantly lower P value than UHMW, but it's still at 50 PSI. We're at 33, so we still okay. It's still worth looking at. We're close, but we're okay. 400 feet per minute, speed refined. But again, we've got a PVE and PTFE of 1,000. We're at 2,000. I'm going to throw that number. I'm going to throw that material out as a candidate. Oil-filled UHMW, I pick up a little bit, a few points in the B value. I go from 50 to 75. That puts me in the safety factor. I add a little bit in the PV value, but not enough. I'm not going to consider UHMW filled or unfilled for this application. Delrin, you can see more than handles the load. PV even looks good, but the speed's not there. What about nylon? Filled nylon, oil filled nylon, solid lube filled nylon. Well, I'm looking good on my P's, my V's, and my PV's. And I know it's not that expensive. 
So that one goes straight to my list, right to the top. If I want a higher safety value, maybe I'm going to look at a filled PTFE, like a Rulon or a fluorescent, something like that. More than handle the load, more than handle the speed, and look at the PV value, 10,000 versus 2,000. That's great, but it's expensive. Why would I go from nylon to a filled Teflon? Unless I need the heat or the chemical compatibility. Look at the composites. In this case, a PTFE filled composite versus a graphite filled or a moly filled. Look at the load values. Now these are again, these are gonna be max static condition. So don't take that 45,000 as the hard true number for a dynamic application. In fact, you're probably gonna to wanna to design the application around something closer to somewhere between 15, 18 to 20,000 PSI. But even at those, we're at 33, right? This material won't even feel the application. Do I need to jump straight into a composite? You know, that's like killing a fly with a bazooka, but maybe I want that. Maybe I want to put this bearing in and I don't have to worry about it for 50 years. Okay, there, again, there's other factors here, not just PV in determining what material we're going to use, but you got to start somewhere and PV is a good place to start. All right, hopefully everybody's staying on top. All right, so let's look at the bearing design worksheet again. Also, one last thing, it's not on here, but I, I do feel it's kind of important. When guys are designing bearings or changing bearings out, going to a plastic or a composite or a urethane or rubber, they, they tend to oversize their bearings. Okay, so a rule of thumb here generally is you, your, your length of the bearing. Guys think that they need a bearing that's you know two and a half feet long. Uh, not necessarily. You want to keep your bearing length about no more than two times the length, uh, uh, you, the uh, diameter, right? So in this case where we've got a two inch ID, I wouldn't design a bearing longer than four inches unless I absolutely needed it. You don't have to put a six inch bearing in there. Again, your math is going to determine, you can play with the numbers and the PVs to determine what your bearing size should actually be. But typically, the length of the bearing does not need to be more than twice the uh, ID or less than half. So I wouldn't go less than one inch in length or more than four inches in length. But again, this is rule of thumb. Let's keep moving. Back to the bearing design worksheet. Still in that same section, but over on the right hand side, you'll see that there's areas there where we're asking for uh, information on the shaft material, the shaft hardness, the surface finish. This is really important, guys, because if the if the shaft is not hard enough, people think plastics are cheap, right? Now they'll chew through this metal like a chainsaw through a kitten if you let it. So you you need to be very careful about the the, the type of material that you're using on the shafts and the hardness. Uh, if it's a stainless steel shaft, let's say it's a piece of food processing equipment that gets washed out a lot, you're not going to want to pick a, a, a bearing in there that's got a lot of abrasive fillers in it. And sometimes the fillers are there for support to make the bearing last longer or to carry higher loads, but they'll eat up a shaft. Okay. You can see what happened with that sprocket down on the right hand side. The, the buyer changed the material types on the sprocket without letting anybody know and the bearing chewed right through it. The bearing that actually did all the damage on that sprocket was perfectly fine. There was almost no material loss whatsoever. If you can believe that, you can reuse the bearing. It was incredible. But the most critical thing to uh, remember, and uh, remember when we did the hand rubbing? Well, I did the hand rubbing and you guys pretended to, is the um, it's critical to remember that the heat is the number one killer of plastic bearings. And I'm talking about composites, rubbers, polyurethane, things like that. But the number two killer is a rough surface finish. Okay, the heat's coming from the kinetic friction. Remember, we're not adding oil and we don't have any rolling elements. So because plastics are thermal insulators, as that shaft or that pin is rotating inside that bearing, there's no way for the heat to get out, right? You're developing a lot of heat through that friction. So the heat's just going to stay in the shaft or in the pin. And it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And then the plastic in contact with that pin is going to get hotter and hotter. And then it's going to start to expand. And then your PV values come crashing down. And then the world ends. But by far, the number two killer is a rough surface finish, which kind of makes sense, right? Because if you've got, here, let me click on this. If you put a plastic bearing or a composite bearing on a rough surface, you're just going to machine it away. All right, it's no longer a pin or a shaft, it's a cutting tool, just like on a lathe or a mill. So 
what kind of surface finish do we need if we're looking at a plastic or a composite? Well, we kind of like to stay in the 8 to 16, 12 range, something like that. Um, if you don't have a surface profilometer, like it's shown in that picture, surface profilometers are kind of expensive. They come in all flavors and sizes, and your, uh, your mileage may vary as to how you use them. But uh, typically, I'll just run my thumbnail across the surface of a shaft or a pin. If I feel a lot of stick slip, you know, it feels like an old LP record, um, it, it's going to machine that bearing away. So you want something that's pretty smooth. You can buy surface comparators to keep in your toolbox or your pocket. Uh, and then compare the surface against what you're putting the shaft on. And that looks like that. So if you have a surface comparator, you can see that the desired surface finish is best achieved by abrasive methods rather than conventional turning processes. So what we're looking for here is a good turn ground polished surface. Okay. Easy. Lastly here, well not lastly, but next, uh, dimensional tolerances. This is a last minute slide because uh, it was brought to my attention. I didn't talk enough about tolerances. So I don't have any notes on this, but we're just going to go through the sheet here. In general, materials move when they're exposed to heat. That's true. Materials have different thermal expansion rates. You certainly know that. Uh, and plastics move more than metals. OK, if you look at the graph down in the lower left, uh, I made that real quick, but you can see the expansion rates, the coefficient of thermal expansion in a linear as opposed to volumetric uh, for, say, steel on the left hand side versus UHMW virgin white on the right hand side. And then a couple of the usual suspects in between uh, PA6 being nylon aluminum and bearing bait bronze. So plastics obviously move a lot more when exposed to temperatures. OK, so the three factors in sizing and bearing properly are going to be the running clearance. If you look at the little thing I made up on the left, you can see the running clearance between the shaft and the bearing. Press fit, uh, look at the running clearance in the graph I made on the lower right. Uh, bearing grade bronze, you're looking at about 2000 running clearance with uh, about a three thousandths press fit. This is on a two inch shaft with a half inch wall thickness bearing versus uh, a nylon bearing to the right. You know, it needs a running clearance of at least ten thousandths with a press fit of at least eight thousandths. Depending on the material, it might be a filled material, so it might have different compression rates. So maybe you don't need that much, maybe you do need that much. It depends on the uh, the size of your bore, the surface finish in the bore, and how big a hammer you're going to use to knock the thing in. But um, but th that just gives you a little bit of a visual reference. And these are really, really important, but I, I don't want you to think that these aren't important because they are as critical as uh, as the PVs. Uh, the press fit is really, really critical because you don't want the bearing to spin in the housing unless it's supposed to. Uh, you know, like you're, you're press fitting it on a shaft and then the OD of the bearing is going to rotate in the housing. But generally, these types of bearings, you're press fitting the plastic bearing or the composite bearing into a housing good and tight. You don't want it to rotate. OK. Uh, and I'll tell you why. And I see this a lot. Guys will replace a bronze bearing that's grease lubricated. They'll put in a nylon bearing or a UHMW bearing. And then uh, they'll use the same dimensional tolerances. Right, so they'll take a, a bronze bearing out or they'll take one off the shelf and then they'll measure it and then they'll go to the lathe, chuck up a piece of UHMW, machine a UHMW bearing the same size as the bronze bearing, exactly, and then they'll press fit it in and it'll be a loose fit. So then they'll put the shaft in there and then they'll start to spin it and then the shaft gets hot and then the plastic expands. And since the plastic can't expand out, it expands in, it chokes onto the shaft and it will either seize onto the shaft and then start rotating, grinding the uh, OD of the bearing out because the surface finished inside the housing bore is lousy. Uh, or it will just seize the shaft. Or it will squeeze the shaft so hard that the motor starts drawing higher amps to try to turn through that resistance and then you pop the overload circuit on the motor. I know that you guys have gone through this before. You have to. Uh, and then last thing would be close in. If you require, in the case of nylon, an 8,000 uh, press fit, how much is the material going to close in? Okay. 
So you have to calculate, you know, maybe it's going to close in half that, depending on the wall thickness of the bearing. Yeah. If it's a big, thick bearing, big, thick wall bearing, you're not going to get as much closing. You might close in a couple thousands, but you have to factor that into your running clearance tolerance now. Okay. You probably have questions on about this, and, and you can you can hit me up afterwards if there's if there, if I'm going too fast through this section. Back to the bearing design worksheet. This is the lower section. Okay, the bottom section that includes a lot of important questions that we need to know to help us narrow down our list of candidate materials. Some of these are really important. Like, is uh, the bearing going to be in an FDA? Is this in a food packaging? Is it in food contact, or is it just in? Uh, a uh, conveyor units below food uh, because if it needs to be FDA or USDA or NSF or 3A or any of that stuff, boy, uh, your list of material candidates really gets uh, gets skinny. OK, what chemicals will the bearing contract uh, contact? Will the bearing experience shock and vibration? Yeah, so we maybe need to get out of the. A more rigid plastic and something that's going to handle the the impact like a composite or um, a nylon or polyurethane uh, what are some of the other things uh load factor radial or axial if you don't know what that is i put some sketches down on the bottom uh, as to the difference between radial and axial uh, are the temperatures gradual or rapid a lot of materials have embrittlement right like uh, pet materials generally have an embrittlement temperature of minus 25 if I'm right uh, so if you're putting it into a freezer tunnel that's minus 40 uh, not a good thing mm, electrical dissipative you know do we need to put carbon uh, or molly or graphite in the bearing to help suck away some uh, uh, electrical some static that might build up things like this and additional notes all important stuff Okay, let's take a look at a couple different applications. Your mileage may vary as to where you're using these things, but a good application for uh, eliminating a grease for a rolling element bearing uh, would be in an application like this. These are bin dumpers. Uh, there's a lot of onion schmoo on the ground, so this is obviously an onion plant. I know it was, uh, where a forklift will lift up the crates of onions, stick them up, put them on that little rotating hammock thing. You can see the bearing location hard place to get up there and grease it's also dirty right it's in a factory so it's probably if it does get greased not greased very often pull that out put in a plastic self-lubricated bearing hanger style composite is i think what i went with on this it's been a lot of years but uh works fine handles the load there's not a lot of speed here a lot of vibration and impact where they're dropping these crates of uh, onions or potatoes or sugar beets onto them Another typical example, I know a lot of you fellows are in the lumber industry, so you're pretty familiar with the kiln carts. Good application. You don't really want to have a greased bearing in a kiln cart wheel. So put in a polymer or a composite. Heavy load, yep. So it's going to have a high P value. Slow speed, yeah, generally. So it'll have a low value. High temperatures, yeah, sort of. They're drying kiln, they're uh, kiln drying wood. Not too bad, though. Uh, a lot of the composites will take this temperature pretty easily and the uh, heat, what do they call them? Not heat treated, heat, uh, now the hot plastics, they'll take it. We got a nylon uh, that, that handles that heat pretty well. High shock, yeah, they drop these carts a lot. During an abrasive, yeah, obviously. So this would be a good example for a, a polymer or a, a, a composite bearing, something dirty. And now here's another question that I always get hit. And you guys will chuckle on this one. Can I grease my plastic bearings? Although the majority of plastics recommended for bearing applications are self-lubricating, meaning that they either have oil or a solid lubricant embedded within the bulk of the material, the use of additional lubrication will, in most cases, enhance the long-term performance of the bearing because friction is reduced and therefore heat buildup is decreased, which is going to extend the wear life of the bearing. Okay, remember, we're really conscious about uh, about heat here. Um, in my experience, I've actively discouraged the use of additional lubrication, except in cases where either speed was an issue, um, 
But if the bearing was on an automatic lube system or if a little breeze of grease would help to eliminate corrosion on the pin, sometimes even in cases where a little grease would assist in the assembly of the device, then it's okay, it's permissible. But it will change the V value component in your calculations if you're going to grease this bearing. Right? Like the first one we did, I think it was a UHMW and the load was fine, but the speed was really bad, right? So some guys will squirt grease in there to kill that V speed, bring the PV value down so that they can get away with using um, virgin unlubricated UHMW. Man, I don't like that. You're cheating and you're gonna forget to purge it and eventually the bearing is going to run dry and then you're going to get into the red zone and you're gonna come crashing. And partner, I see this all the time, have for years. And then it always comes back to, well, I tried plastic, but it didn't work, okay? Yeah, uh, so you can continue to purge, use grease to purge the plastic if you're really trying to get out a lot of abrasive schmoo. Uh, the thing there is you gotta keep doing it or you gotta put a seal on it, you know, to retain that grease and keep the dirty contaminants out. The only time I really feel, feel good about recommending a little bit of grease on a bearing is if you're trying to keep the shaft or the pin from corroding I see this a lot in places like um, ski resorts. Um, I see this in real wet environments, like in uh, uh, car washes, things like that, uh, where putting a little bit of grease on the on the metal shaft or the pin to keep it from corroding, generally not a bad idea. Yeah, especially if it's a real clean environment, you're not too afraid of the, the grease getting dirty and becoming a lapping compound then it's okay but mind you just a little bit just kiss it with a you know like like toothpaste on the end of your finger or something just a little bit of weight lifting grease on there don't go don't go bananas don't start pumping the grease all over the place uh all right i don't expect you guys to remember a whole lot of this but um things like surface finish loads too high stuff like that but it's okay you just relax we're right there to help you it's not that hard. We can do the calculations. We can do the material design. We can make the bearings. We can do the failure analysis. We can do all that good stuff. Um, it's what we do. So we're there to help you. So don't don't feel weird about, about calling and asking. Uh, it's important that you learn to recognize what went wrong before you just completely say, I'm not using plastic bearings. It won't work. I've tried it in the past. So what did go wrong? Let's look at a couple of examples. This is a freezer tunnel conveyor bearing. Temperature was minus 40. Doesn't matter CRF, it's all the same. Uh, this was a filled floor polymer it was in a freezer tunnel. So what went wrong? All right, well, clearly the shaft wasn't replaced. So these bearing inserts, it was a spherical bearing insert. You can see the picture up on the right hand side. That's not an actual one, but it's pretty similar. Um, they, they didn't change the shaft out, all right? There were rolling element bearings in there in the past a spherical self-aligning uh, metal ball bearing. Uh, and if you've used those before, you know that you slide the shaft inside the inner race and then you lock the inner race onto the shaft with some set screws. OK, well, those set screws tend to bite into the into the shaft and they'll create divots over time. Uh, there was also some dirt and some contamination, as you can tell, because these are bearings are, are dirty. Uh, they didn't clean that out. So the shafts were bitten into, it looked like a dog had been chewing on them um, because they hadn't been resurfaced over the years. They hadn't been sleeved or replaced. So when they put a plastic bearing on without doing anything to change the surface finish, they just machined right through the bearing. Yeah. Should, should still be in service. But we did eventually correct that and go back and fix everything. What went? Uh, oh, here's another good one. Uh, this is in a in a uh, glass factory. There's a lot of glass particulates everywhere. Look at the shaft. This is on a uh, pallet loading device within the factory. The guys did you know their best, but you can tell what happened here is that there was a bronze bearing inside that sprocket assembly. The bronze bearing's gone. It just got eaten away because they would have periodically greased the pin. You can see that the Zerk fitting there has a plastic cap on it. I, I, I don't know. I think the last time this machine got greased is when it was painted. But um, the end of the cap is white because I rubbed it off with my finger to see what was going on. 
but it, it never got greased, so they never purged out the old grease, which had become contaminated with glass dust. And you can see that uh, it ate the bearing and it ate the shaft. So the solution there, replace the pin, put a new pin in there with a good surface finish, remove the grease fitting, replace the bronze bearing with a composite bearing, which is what I did end up using after doing the PV calculations. And then we added an inexpensive seal to keep contaminants out of the interface, out of the running clearance between the bronze, the uh, composite bearing and the shaft. They should get 20 years out of this machine, no problem, with no service. Well, we keep the, because there's no grease in there, right? So the grease isn't going to hold the glass, right? Uh, let's look at some things that went right. See typical applications. I know a lot of you guys are are, are lumber guys. So you'll see replacing a rolling element or a, a greased bronze bearing in the sweeps in the kickers, log kickers, or in the pivot joints in the bucking saws. You know, these are typical applications. You find a lot of composites, uh, good places for composite and uh, filled nylons like our tough cast bearings on things like log decks on unscramblers, lots of the lots of applications. You just have to be mindful of the loads and the speeds, right? And also that you take care to keep most of the contamination out of the bearing journal out, outside the running clearances. But you can do that with a cheap uh, seal, UHFW seal, heck, maybe even a felt wiper or a polyurethane or an old piece of uh, conveyor belting. Don't do that, don't, don't do that. Uh, Let's take a look at another one. Um, okay, so this is a similar application to what we saw on the conveyor belt in the freezer tunnel. Uh, we did all the speeds, the uh, load and speeds well within range of a composite bearing. This is on pump jack pivot bearing way up in Canada somewhere. Uh, so what went wrong? Well, you can see what went wrong is that the pin was not replaced. Um, you can either replace the pin or the shaft with a, with, a, with a good surface finish one, or you can machine past all of the, the, the roughness down to a good surface finish and then adjust your bearing accordingly to, to account for the material you're removing, or you can sleeve the whole uh, messy end of the, of the shaft and then, again, accommodate your, uh, your new bearing to, uh, with a new size because you've sleeved the, uh, the bad pin or shaft with a good surface finish, you know, like a speedy sleeve or something. Maybe not a speedy sleeve, those tend to be thin and for seals, but uh, yeah, you, can, you, can, you can use a speedy sleeve sometimes. We just fixed this by going back and telling them to do better on the pin. This is a good application. This is a uh, attachments for agriculture. In this case, it was the groomer attachment for ski slopes. Uh, they were using the metal bearing and then pumping it full of grease. Uh, but everything was still rusting because they weren't greasing it very uh, periodically. Everything squeaked and squalled, and you can see all the grease points. You're bound to miss one. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're always going to miss a, a zerk somewhere. It's buried or it's covered in schmoo, and you'll never see it. So just pop them all out and replace them. Again, this was a composite application because it was a very high load, low speed application. In this case, I did recommend that they do apply a little bit of grease just to keep the uh, uh, water displaced from melting snow and things like that keep the pins from corroding and becoming cutting tools good application though and i don't have any notes on this one i threw this one last minute uh, i don't remember what piece of equipment this was or what was on the other side but this is a typical bearing a uh, plastic bearing application you see these split block bearings uh, those appear to be just uhmw uh, they'll work if the loads and speeds are accommodated. The issue here in this one, the thing that gives me a little bit of concern is the amount of corrosion that you see on the pin, on the shafts. Those are probably actually not shafts. Uh, those look like shaft collars um, that are clamped on there, but they're corroding like crazy. And absolutely no uh, mitigation for ingress of rust or dirt or dust. So my recommendation is keep doing what you're doing as long as there's no misalignment issue and these are probably in a previous life or when this machine was made i'm assuming there were uh, self-aligning spherical rolling element bearings on those uh, bearing flanges and they replaced them with the uhmw because there was no speed i just can't remember uh, 
but uh, I would do this. I'd clean up all the dust, all the uh, rust off of those collars, evaluate the shaft condition, uh, and then put everything back together, maybe give it a light film of grease to keep the corrosion from reoccurring, and then cap the whole end of it to protect it from washdown or, or dust or dirt or further corrosion. You could, if you wanted to, if they increase the speed on this, is to keep using the UHMW housings, but then open up the ID a little bit and then put an insert of a different type, like a filled PTFE, right, which I, you see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, that's going to give you a lot more speed, better wear properties. I and mean, it's still pretty cheap because the bulk of the bearing, right, the whole housing is still UHMW or nylon. So not too expensive. Uh, you've probably all seen these these property charts. I think we have it on our website. Don't remember, but uh, you can see. Well, this isn't really uh, involved in bearings too much, so maybe this will be for a presentation down the road. Uh, looks like we're getting close to the end here, so we're going to wrap it up. A little bit about Redwood. We currently operate in six locations in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, all over the place. If you don't know what the U.S. or Canada look like, they look a little bit like this. You can find your spot on the map and then uh, call us accordingly. I assume that you folks already know what we offer. Uh, all types of plastics, rubber, uh, polyurethane. Uh, we either make it or we uh, uh, distribute it so if it's hard or it's softer it tastes good on a salad we can get it for you and a lot of you fellows in the uh, lumber industry uh, already know that we provide these things but uh, if you're looking for more we certainly would be obliged uh, uh, lower right hand side last bullet point we're also making etc so i think we have a sale of etc if you need some of those and um, that's the end. Happy to take any questions you might have. Um, you can always call me direct or get a hold of me through your local branch or local representative. Is anybody awake? Angela, are you there? I'm here, I'm Kevin. Here. Hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we just have one question so far. And uh, like I said, anybody can I think I'm echoing. Um, but you can answer the question in the chat box. But we have one question in regards to what your opinion in, is in regards to using um, equivalent materials instead of trademark materials. Oh, yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, uh, you mean using just uh, regular acetyl as opposed to Delrin or using any type of PTFE as opposed to the um, Teflon, the uh, DuPont trademark stuff. You know, it really depends. Sometimes, you know, this comes in, this is almost always an issue when you're dealing with things like PEAK uh, and PTFE. Should I, should, you know, and Delrin, should I be using Delrin as opposed to acetyl? Um, what about, should I be using PPS versus PEAK? Um, you know, it really depends. Um, a lot of it, when you're dealing with a, a good trade name type stuff, it's easier to find data on it, but it's application specific. You know, if, if you don't need if you don't need a copolymer acetyl, a homopolymer will work. Um, then just go with regular acetyl as opposed to, to ponying up for for paying for the, the Delrin. It really is application specific, so I just I don't want to poo poo trade name plastics, but um, you know, it's it's application specific. I don't always reach for the trade name stuff when I'm designing something or when I'm machining stuff in my own shop. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. It's kind of a case by case basis, really. Okay. Also, with things like peak and stuff like that, and you're looking at the data, and let's say you're designing a new piece of equipment or something like that, you know, make sure that you're looking for the data of the material you're going to actually be using, whether it's extruded or it's cast. OK, or if you're looking at the material specs for the resin versus the finished product. Does that make sense? And always double check the sources. Well, hopefully that's another question. question, not they can send an email. Mm -hmm. um, another question is 
I'd like to hear more about your composite bearings. Mm -hmm. Is it metal plus plastic or plus ceramic? Uh, you cut out there. I heard composite bearings, but yeah. And it um, is it plastic plus metal or plastic plus ceramic? Oh well, anytime you're dealing with a composite, that simply means more than one material, right? So lots of folks will consider a fiberglass shell with a PTFE um, or Nomex liner a composite, and it is. It's it's perfectly accurate to call that a composite bearing. Uh, the composite bearings that I'm talking about in this presentation, uh, yeah, it, it's a polymer fabric uh, that has uh, lubricating properties embedded within it, whether it's a graphite or it's a moly or a PTFE or a combination of those things. They're very high load. They tend to be for very high low, low speed applications. Oscillation, you know, pivot is best. They'll certainly go full rotation, but you have to be very mindful of the speeds. Because although the lubricant fillers, the PTFEs, the graphites, mollies, things like that, have extremely high operating temperatures, the bulk of the bearing, the um, industrial fabric uh, in it, whether it's a poly uh, ester um, or uh, they have lower temperature uh, melt temperatures, so you got to be very very mindful of heat in those applications. So you know if there's a lot of heat and you know to a guy like me heat and speed are the same thing they should be the same thing for all you guys when you're dealing with bearings think of that speed and heat is basically the same thing uh, it's not always a bad idea to lubricate them add additional lubrication as long as you can keep dirt and stuff out you know so using a seal is good water purging can be good a lot of composites are used underwater because they have very low uh, swell so for marine applications like rudders, stern tubes, if you're making a cutlass bearing out of a composite, these things are fantastic. I, I mean, they really are miracles of materials, so they work real well. But composite bearings are a whole presentation in and of themselves. So maybe we'll do one of those down the road. Lots of folks don't like the machine composites. They call them phenolics, and phenolics are a composite, but they're a whole different world of industrial laminates. Um, so I guess when the people are asking about composite bearings, are you talking about a composite bearing? What type of composite bearing? Is it an industrial laminate or is it a fiber wound or filament wound bearing with a liner? Those tend to be very, very good for clean applications in full rotation, higher speeds because they've got PTFE liners inside, but you, you really got to be careful about contamination and dirt and rough shafts because it's a very thin liner, but they're good bearings particularly good in slide and linear applications. But I, I, I yeah, different presentation. <laughs> We're going to have to do a part two. Uh, there's yeah, because you can do an hour just on composites all by themselves. <laughs> yeah. There's um, lots of other questions here too. Um, what kind of fit <clears throat> tolerance of bearing with plastic do you recommend? Has to be tighter than bronze, has to be tighter than bronze bearing. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it, you don't want it to rotate. You know, a good example of this, you always have to consider that materials, that plastic materials have a lot different thermal expansion. And the rate for thermal expansion on UHMW, look, UHMW is a fantastic material, right? You can get it in any color. It's cheaper than beer. It's got fantastic impact. About the best, you know what? Let me go back. I don't know. Can you still see this? Can you still see the slide thingy? Yeah, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but OK, yeah. So if you look at the uh, in, in this Brady Bunch graphic here, if you look at dugga, 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 uh, yeah, look at the center section on the right for impact strength. Look where UHMW is, man. You can pound on this stuff all day long and it's not going to give too much, right? From an impact standpoint, this is why you see it as bumpers a lot. And you're not using rubber or polyurethane. Um, you can just pound on this stuff all day long and it's just not going to give much. If you go over two spaces to the left, look at the UHMW. It's the seventh plastic over from the left. Uh, so if you're looking in the center left quadrant under compressive strength, pretty crummy compressive strength relative to PA6 nylon, which is the, are the first two, right? 
So if I've got a, a load, if I'm considering a bearing for a static load, I'm probably, you know, you got to do the math, right? You got to do the P calculations there, but I'm probably more likely in most cases to pick a nylon over a UHMW because it's not an impact application, right? It's just a load. I need the compressive strength. But if I'm making a bumper or something like that, let's say it's on the back of a truck, if I'm not going to use rubber, I'm going to reach for UHMW every time. But the thermal expansion just is terrible, right? So for all of the great things that UHMW are, it is, it's about the worst material out there for thermal expansion. This stuff grows and shrinks like crazy. Uh, you'd have to be pretty desperate to put it in a rotary bearing application, unless you're, you're moving very, very slow and your speeds, your ambient conditions, um, temperatures are real low. Uh, otherwise, I mean, if you reach for UHMW as a rotary bearing, right before you consider anything else, uh, you're rolling the dice. Um, uh, so getting back to, uh, you know, I lost my track there. So press fit, yeah. So if you're putting, and I see this, where guys will take a bronze bearing out, like a plain bronze bearing, let's say it's in a hold down or it's in a bucking cell or something like that in a mill. Um, they'll take the bronze bearing out, they'll measure it. Let's say it's got a five inch OD, okay? And they're pressing this into just a kiss under a five inch uh, housing bore. Okay, so they'll machine up the UHMW or the nylon, and then they'll press fit it in and they don't get an extremely tight press, all right? Because they've machined it to the same size as the bronze, which requires a much, much lower uh, lower press fit. You're still getting the same amount of press fit. It's just the compression rate of the material that's changing. Nylon or UHMW is a lot softer than bronze. So as you're pressing into a tight hole, obviously it's going to give more, but you do not want that bearing to rotate because as it starts to warm up, right through friction with the shaft the bearing can't get any bigger outwise you know uh, in, in outer diameter because it's captured right you've pressed it into a metal housing so it's not going to grow that way so as it continues to grow increase its volumetric area it's going to close in on that shaft which is what i was talking about earlier and if it grabs onto that shaft like grim death and will not let go and then that motor keeps trying to turn that shaft then you're going to start to spin that bearing you see this a lot in shivs right where they're where they amp up the speed speed goes up heat goes up bearing gets bigger grabs onto the shaft the the uh, uh, the cable or the rope is continuing to spin that uh, that shiv and then you start to spin the bearing inside the shiv or inside the housing and while surface finish is very easy to control on a pin or a shaft remember we were talking the rms like uh, 8 to 16 surface finish nobody ever considers the surface finish in their housing right so these guys that take the bearing out in the, in the lumber mill you know they'll clean up the shaft real well and make it look great but they never go in and they kiss the inside of the housing so the inside of the housing is generally rough there may be oxidation corrosion in there and there might be a lot of schmoo in there that never got cleaned out and then they press a plastic bearing or a composite bearing into this housing and then they start to spin it well the bearing gets eaten from the outside in yeah so a tight fit is really important because you do not want these bearings to rotate. If you're not comfortable with that you can get sufficient press fit and you think that bearing might rotate, lock it in. Put in a set screw or put in some sort of keeper bar or put in a key or machine a flat on the bearing and then press it in with an accommodating flat in the housing. You do not want the bearing to change, to, uh, to rotate inside the housing. Yeah, does that make sense? Makes sense to me. <laughs> That's what makes sense to I, I might only be talking to you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> I can't see if there's anybody on here, so it might just be me talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we have each other. Um, there's a, another question is, what is the maximum temperature that UHMW can withstand? It depends on the UHMW. They have heat stabilized materials like Tyvar hot, Tyvar being uh, tough, inert, very abrasive. It's manufactured by Quadrant. We distribute quite a bit of that stuff and it's great stuff. I really like it. So you can't just say UHMW is good for this temperature because UHMW is like 
say in uh, soup, there's a lot of different types. OK, so some of them are heat stabilized, like some of the Tyvars, your Tyvar hots. The you also have to consider what is the continuous service temperature? How much uh, how much temperature is this plastic going to suffer uh, over a long term versus short term? OK, so there's short term max temperatures. There's continuous running temperatures. Um, there's, there's a lot to it. So just to ask what the. Um, well, I got a book. And a lot of this stuff is available online, but uh, this is. I need the polyolefin book. So for example, uh, continuous surface temperature for um, Service temperature for a regular UHMW uh, is going to be about 180 degrees. So it's pretty much 180 degrees across the board for most of your UHMWs as a continuous service temperature in air. Okay. You can get heat stabilized stuff like some of the tie bars, like the hots and things like that, will go up to 275 continuous. But uh, when it comes to UHMW, a rule of thumb is I really wouldn't push it much further than 150. Is, 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 you're going to see expansion a lot faster than that. You can see expansion on UHMW every day just by driving around. You see UHMW bumpers or bus curbs, things like that, where they're buckled. Go down to a marina where it's cold in the morning and hot in the afternoon, and you see the stuff wavy, um, busting out mounting bolts, things like that. We're only talking about bearings, though, at this point. So the number one key or the number one uh, uh, bit of advice I can give you for UHMW bearing uh, as a bearing material is to reconsider. Um, double check your math. You, you can get into other materials like the tough cast, you know, the, the redwood tough cast, the, the filled nylons. They're so much better. You know, they've got much, much, uh, you know, better properties as a bearing and the only thing you have to be careful on the nylons is where uhmw has the worst thermal expansion nylons have the, the, the worst um, moisture absorption so you got to be mindful if these are going into a wet environment that you may have volumetric increase in the bearing size if you're using a nylon if you're machining a part out of a nylon and you think it might swell because it's going in water that's just to take it throw it in a bucket of water for a couple of days then take it out and machine it it's never going to get any bigger than than uh, than it is at that point, except through thermal expansion when it gets hot. But uh, volumetrically, it's it's already absorbed as much water. It's at full saturation at that point. But you do have to be mindful when you're working with nylons. Now, some of your heavier filled nylons, like the tough cast 010s and the 015s, that are either solid or oil filled, or other types of oil filled nylons, they don't have as much moisture absorption because they're filled, as opposed to an unfilled nylon. And that's pretty much true with uh, the heat stabilization in UHMWs. That's why you build a material candidate list, right? If you're not sure about one material, look at a couple others. Look at an acetyl. Uh, look at a composite. Look at a polyurethane that has self-lubricating properties into it. And I recommend the 750XL. I love that material. Okay, we've got two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, one is uh, any plastic materials for aggressive wear resistance coating you would recommend? Any plastics for wear resistance coating? Yeah. Um, is this a coating question or a bearing question? Um, I think, well, it says coating in the question, so I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not sure how to answer the question. Um, that's a big it depends question. <laughs> yeah, well, I need to know a little bit more about the application. What, yeah. what, what are, you, you know, are you looking for a very wear resistant plastic? Um, or are you looking for any plastic that's on a, a wear resistant, uh, you know, hardened metal shaft or pin? Because there's K factors, which are the wear factors of materials. And you can generally find published data on most polymer materials uh, relative to the K factor or the wear factor. But again, that's really, really subjective based on the surface finish based on the temperatures, loads, and speeds. Well, and just what's being conveyed as well, or mm -hmm. what's it, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, whoever that is, we can uh, just send us an email and then we can we can get back to you once we know more about the application. Um, another another question is um, we've got a couple more that have come in. Um, and what what should I consider for electrical? I think it's supposed to say applications. <laughs> electrical applications where you're either trying to. Uh, well, plastics are electrical insulators primarily, so if you're looking at at, at isolating an electrical in a bearing application, you just want to make sure that you're using something unfilled. You have to look at temperature, speeds, and loads, of course, but generally folks will go with, uh, I wouldn't go into a typical um, non-conductive materials like a, a, a phenolic, uh, although they can sometimes make good bearings with no electrical conductivity. Um, you can go with a composite bearing that does not have any, maybe a PTFE filled composite. Again, you want to look at the shaft and uh, uh, so PTFEs, any unfilled plastic uh, should work fine. If you're looking for the other way, you want electrical conductivity through it, then you have to go the other way and go with something that does have a filled, like a graphite filler in there, somewhere to bleed that static or that electrical through it. Um, what else? Uh, well, there's a few options there, but if this is a bearing application and you look for or you're looking for electrical um, uh, non-conductivity, uh, then there's lots of applications. There are lots of different materials that will handle that. We have to look at the loads. We have to look at the speeds. We have to look at contamination issues and temperature. But if you're just looking for electrical insulation, uh, it'd be fine. Use UHMW. Don't use UHMW. <laughs> God. It's suppose you could. If the loads and the speeds are okay, you can use it. I'm not trying to just crap all over UHMW, but it's just sometimes it's the too easy answer sometimes. All right. I think that's all the time we have. Um, a little bit over, but we had lots of great questions there, so I wanted to try to get to them all. So um, thank you again so much, Kevin. And um, if there's any other questions that come up um, for anybody afterwards, please send us an email and we'll be sure to get back to you within the business day um, about uh, any clarifications you might need. So yeah, and you said that they're going to get copies of this or something. Yeah, like, I'll, well, I'll, be sending, me. yeah I'll be sending out a recording of the presentation in a couple of days and um, and a copy of um, um, those bearing the bearing worksheets and the flange bearing, um, design worksheets as well. So everybody will get a copy of those if you haven't already found them on our website. Cool. Well, anyways, thanks. Uh, thanks again, uh, Kevin, and uh, everybody have a uh, safe and healthy afternoon. Thanks, Angela. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.